Well, today we're going to talk about uh, uh, resource efficiency in the context of uh, allocation in a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, hi, my name is Vincent Seval. I'm working for a company called uh, Lombardier. I'm an architect. I'm, I'm involved in a cross-unit team called PlatformOps, which aims at uh, delivering uh, the platform as a product. And uh, in that context, I'm involved in different uh, projects. Uh, I've been involved in OpenShift for quite some time now, and specifically deployment on OpenShift. And lately, I've been involved in uh, um, our deployment of Kafka on the OpenShift platform, plus the, uh, the Quarkus application framework. All right, so Lombardier is a private bank based in Switzerland, and uh, we've got the traditional line of businesses that you would expect, uh, and plus something that we call technology for banking. Uh, what we're doing is that we develop internally our own core banking system, which we make available to the bank itself, obviously, but to other external banks. Uh, then in that context, we re-instantiate our core banking system so that we can op operate uh, their activity from our data centers based in, uh, in Switzerland. Uh, so we have uh, four, I mean, traditional functional development streams uh, and a very modular uh, architecture uh, that was started 25 years ago uh, with many technologies. Uh, the last 15 years, we invested a lot on, uh, on Java, but that's not the, the, only, the only technology. And um, we've got a lot of flexibility and our system, uh, uh, thanks to this, uh, to this architecture, but a few challenges as well. All right, in 2020, we started a large uh, modernization uh, initiative called GX, uh, where we are looking at the functional side, but also at the technical side, and we started introducing new technology, OpenShift being uh, one of the first ones. So the story uh, starts probably a year and a half ago, uh, when we were starting to ramp up our workload on our uh, Kubernetes cluster. And we started seeing this kind of message uh, a little bit uh, uh, too often. Um, then, well, basically there were two reasons for this. Uh, the first reason is the, was the, uh, the, the cluster we were using was pretty small. Uh, and the, the workload was uh, starting to pile up. But the other reason was we did not have a, a good understanding about how resource allocation works inside the Kubernetes cluster. So um, for some time, we tried to solve that uh, with extra capacity that we were adding to the cluster, but that, that didn't get us very far. Eventually, we had actually to, I mean, handle the, handle the problem. All right, so what we're going to talk uh, about today is optimizing placement of pods in uh, a cluster so that we can tune adequately uh, your, your work on all so that you can size the underlying hardware appropriately and all of that so that you can avoid waste and save money but without sacrificing the behavior. And that's, that's where the efficiency uh, comes from. When you can respect your SLOs and, but squashing as much as possible the, the resources that you're using in your cluster. So at that point you could be wondering Okay, what, what is, I mean, what's particular about uh, all of this? I mean, I've been doing capacity planning on traditional workload for many, many years. And I guess the big difference is that we're moving from static workload to dynamic workload, uh, where uh, as opposed to treat your VMs uh, as pets, now you've got your worker nodes that are cattle, and you standardize uh, the configuration for your worker node, so you have to be better at uh, tuning your, your workload underneath. All right, so at Lombardier, we've got currently uh, three main clusters, one for development and integration, one for STNT, UAT, and one for production. We've got another smaller one for production for different use case, and we're expanding uh, the number of uh, cluster we're installing. So we're working uh, on the uh, in and uh, we are in the process of deploying another cluster into the, the public cloud. Um, I'm just showing the applicative pod. So that, that's the pods for the components that we are writing um, ourselves. Um, actually, our, our uh, worker nodes, our cluster, 
uh, has something like 1,300 or 1,400 pods uh, when you take everything into account, including the third party and all the supporting, uh, supporting workloads. We're running OpenShift 4.8 uh, on the virtualized uh, VMware infrastructure. We've synchronized our, our worker nodes. And uh, one thing on the hardware at the hypervisor level is that we're using a CPU overcommit uh, with a ratio of 1 to 5. So at the end of the GX project, we'll probably be running more than 20,000 pods across all clusters. And uh, I mean, by definition, we won't be able to do fine tuning on all those workloads with this, this amount of, uh, of uh, containers and pods running in our, in our platform. All right, so when we talk about resources on the container, we need to take into account two different notions. The first one is request, which is the minimum uh, amount of resource that is required for Kubernetes to, to schedule your uh, container and your pod on a specific worker node. So we say it's a schedule time notion. Although uh, for CPU, it maps also to the CPU shares at the, in, the, uh, in the C groups, so it's, it's used as well on runtime. In the context of that discussion, we'll focus on the, the schedule time aspect. And there is the limit, which is the maximum amount of resource that uh, your container will be able to use uh, on your worker node, right? This is runtime. In terms of resource types, then uh, we have CPU, which is said to be a compre compressible resource, which means that uh, in, in these two situations, when the usage reaches the limit, assuming one limit has been defined for your pod, or the node reaches 100% of its capacity, then the pod is going to be slowed down. It's not going to crash. It's going to be throttled. But your position to memory, which is a non compressible resource, um, so there are two, two situations to consider here. When usage reaches limit, then you will have a pod uh, out of memory. So your pod will restart, uh, uh, either on the same worker node or on a different worker node. Or uh, the other situation is when you use all the memory on your worker node, then in that case, you've got a memory pressure situation on the node, and uh, the Kubernetes scheduler will start doing some eviction on your pod and restart the pod somewhere else uh, to free up some, some resources. So, so here, and at, I mean, the situation we had with the error message I was showing, basically this was a request problem on CPU. Right? And that's what we're going to talk about, which is basically we were reaching uh, the, uh, the, 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 the full capacity of our nodes. Okay, so we need to, to find the right balance between oversizing the request, uh, which give you high behavior predictability because you're going to over-reserve resources for your workload, but it's going to give you low density, so a low efficiency. Um, to some extent, if you're using overcommit at the virtualization layer, you'll be able to compensate some of it, but not, not everything. So we'll say this is a performance-optimized performance, performance optimized approach. And you need to balance that with the opposite, which is undersizing the request in your cluster, where you're going to have low behavior predictability because you will have high density. So you'll be gambling the usage of your, uh, of your resources against the performance of, uh, of your workload. If we're talking about CPU starving, then you'll get some throttling on your, your worker. On your, on your pod. If we're talking about memory, then uh, uh, you may have some evictions. So we could say that there is a high density, so high efficiency, but if you start having some throttling or some evictions, you're going to lower your efficiency. So you're going to use, on, you're going to sacrifice the behavior of your, uh, of your pod. So we'll say in that situation, it's a cost-optimized approach. So, so how do we uh, sit right in the middle where we assess precisely the, the request we need to set up on our, uh, on our uh, workload. Well, one idea is to look at past behavior. So let's, let's take a small uh, example. Uh, we've got four pods running on an ideal worker node, and we've got resources ranging from 25 to 1100, uh, with workloads behaving very differently, uh, some with peaks and low activity, uh, some with a lot of activity all the time. Uh, so the first question is, what's the minimal worker node that you need to run this, uh, this workload? Uh, so where you've got the least amount of waste and you don't, have, uh, you don't sacrifice on the behavior. But actually, the better question is, what do I need to reserve for each of my pods, right? Because you're all going to configure them independently from one another because each pod doesn't know where it's going to sit and we're going to be the neighbors. So do you take the average consumption? Do you take the max consumption on, on each node? 
Another way to look at this graph is to look at the, the, uh, the cumulative consumption over time. Uh, so it's very easy to see that the, the optimal host would be the one which is sitting at the peak of this graph. So in, in that situation, 79. Now, if you took the average consumption of each pod and you summed that, uh, what would happen is that you would get a, the, a host with 1,200 capacity. Uh, so you've got a lot of density because you're taking a lot of the resources that are available on the node. But what you can see is that five times out of 10, the uh, workload is going to try to consume more capacity than you've got in your worker nodes. So if we're talking about CPU, you'll get some throttling. If we're talking about memory, you'll get some eviction. And we don't necessarily want that. Now, if you took the max, you've got the opposite situation where you over-reserve resources for your workload. So you've got lots of extra capacity. So you're not going to have any throttling or any eviction, but uh, you're going to waste a lot of resources. So we, we need something in the middle, which is what VPI is doing. So um, one of the metric is to take the percentile, which basically covers most of your activity and uh, get rid of the peaks uh, of activity. Now, in that situation, you will get uh, uh, a house with 2,500 of resources. So it sits somewhere between the optimal and the max. So you, you have a, a, a little bit of waste, waste, but not too much. And more importantly, you don't sacrifice the behavior. You don't get throttling. If you look at pod one in particular, you can see that the P90 is going to be nine times out of 10 uh, your resource usage. So the question is, what happens uh, to your peak, right? Well, it's going to be uh, financed by your neighbors that are not going to hopefully doing the peaks, their peaks at the same time. So there is a little bit of gambling and then you benefit from the extra capacity that is provided and reserved for the others, but, but not used. And that's basically doing uh, the exact same of a commit that we were doing initially at the virtualization layer, but we're doing it at the pod level. All right, so vertical pod autoscaler, this is a Kubernetes project, and it can provide, provide uh, recommendation uh, on uh, resource usage and specifically on the amount of resources you need to reserve for your pod. So basically that helps you configuring the request can help you as well in configuring the, the limits. Uh, the interesting thing is that it's going to watch your uh, containers all the time. So it can give you up-to-date recommendation and this recommendation can change over time. This is not a tuning uh, that you're doing six months ago and you keep while actually your workload is evolving in, in terms of behavior. Uh, it's CRD based, so it's completely compliant with your GitOps, uh, GitOps approach. And you can either connect it to Prometheus to gather the metrics, or it's going to watch directly uh, the resource usage on your pod and uh, consolidate and compile those metrics into, uh, into a format which is itself stored inside a different CR, which is called the, the checkpoint. Interestingly, it can upscale or downscale the resources uh, that, has been co that have been configured uh, depending on the situation. Maybe you, know, you need more CPU, maybe you need less. Uh, it can work on memory and CPU, and optionally, it can apply the recommendation uh, on your workload. Right, it's available on the public cloud uh, through different offering, and at Lombard Audio, we're using it through uh, a dedicated and supported OpenShift operator. That's what we're doing. All right, so let's take an example. Here's the main CR. Uh, that you would create uh, for a specific workload. In that context, it's a deployment. Uh, for the control resources, you can say uh, that you want to work on CPU or memory or both. Uh, the control value, you've got a choice for the request only or request on limit. You cannot choose limits uh, only. And for the update mode, uh, you've got four options. So off means uh, you, VPA is going to provide a recommendation, but it's not going to apply it for you. Initial means the recommendation will be uh, applied at the next startup. It could be a crash or it could be a normal rollout. Uh, recreate means that if the recommendation is too far off from what you've configured on uh, your uh, workload initially, so for instance on your deployment, uh, then it's going to detect that and it, the VPA is going to trigger a restart of your, of your pod and it will restart with the, the recommendations applied. And the last mod, auto, is today doing the same thing as the recreate because uh, the 
try to change uh, request and uh, in Kubernetes today is to do a restart. After a while, after watching your uh, container working for some time, um, VPA will calculate a recommendation uh, that uh, appears directly into the CR in the status section, and there are four metrics. The most important one is the target, which is based on the uh, P90, like we saw, like we saw before, uh, for all the, uh, the controlled resources. Uh, you've got the lower band, which is the, the P50, uh, P50, and you've got the upper band, which is the P95. Right, so in this particular context, we're running an initial, so at the next startup, our deployment was originally configured with 100 uh, millicores and one gig of RAM, and the pod, the controller, will replace at startup uh, those resources with the, the calculated values. In terms of uh, use cases, um, we're using VPA at Lombardier for stateless workloads and, and jobs and cron jobs. Uh, but there is, also, there, there is also an additional use case which is interesting, which is the stateful workload, um, where um, uh, scaling horizontally stateful workload might be specific to the technology that you're using. So in that situation, VPA is a very good option to uh, grab more resources. There are some, a few limitations, however, uh, when you're using VPA. Um, it is said in the documentation that you should be using uh, a VPA to control memory and JVM-based uh, workload. It, this is essentially related to the way uh, the JVM manages memory and the limited visibility it provides uh, on, on the heap to the, uh, to the VPA or, I mean, uh, the metrics that are coming from Prometheus. Another thing to look into is, to, um, uh, is uh, what you've got to be careful is uh, using VPA with HPA. And typically, you cannot, use, you cannot use a control resource like CPU and VPA and use it as the base metric for scaling on HPA. So you can use both, but not on the same metric. You have to be careful about that, otherwise they're going to work against one another. Um, the auto-recreate by design is not by default uh, going to trigger any restart on your pods if there is only one pod in the replica set. Otherwise, that would mean uh, some inevitability on, you, on your service. Um, you have to be careful, and you, you have, if, you, if you give, um, I mean, if you're using the initial or even the recreate or auto mod, you have to be careful about potential excessive recommendation that VPA would be doing because it doesn't understand fully your, your workload. And you want to make sure that the sum of all the requests that will be calculated by uh, VPA do not exceed your, your, your cluster capacity. Uh, one thing, uh, one pinfall is that there is only one VPA object uh, allowed per workload. So if you create two VPA objects for the same deployment, uh, VPA is going to select only the, the oldest, oldest one, is going to ignore uh, the, uh, the most recent one. And the last thing is that there are some distributions that limit uh, the number of VP objects you can have in a single cluster. So for instance, GKE uh, allows only 500 objects into the cluster. Um, uh, OpenShift doesn't say that they have this limitation, but they warn you about the resource usage that VPA has and takes to calculate all of those metrics. So you really have to, I mean, to be careful about, uh, I mean, to check how VPA is scaling uh, to uh, monitor all of your pods. So where are we in, uh, in Lombardier? Um, so we've deployed VPA on all clusters. Uh, we're using the request only mode. That was bas that's basically an answer to the initial problem that, that we're having. And we're also starting to experiment with uh, the OpenShift hiding on the dev cluster. And that explains some of the numbers on the dev cluster, which are pretty low. Uh, nothing to do with VPA, but it's another uh, uh, tool in the toolbox uh, for capacity planning. Um, one thing that we did is that we created a capacity planning governance board where we meet uh, every month. And basically, we track uh, usage versus requested for memory and CPU. Uh, the goal is at some point that the request will, uh, will uh, be aligned uh, on the, the real usage. Uh, we still have a bit of this discrepancy on the CPU request versus usage. 
uh, there might be, uh, well, we're still uh, analyzing this. Uh, it might be uh, related to the other type of workload that are running on a, on a worker node and that are not covered by, uh, by VPA. Uh, but basically, the next challenge that we have, we, we cannot solve the, the, v, the CPU situation, and uh, the next challenge is going to be about memory. So for CPU, we're running initial on all nodes. Uh, we've got default values for, for our uh, Java workloads. Uh, but those values can be overridden by the different development teams. And one thing that was very interesting when we looked at the result calculated by VPA is that we had a very low value, meaning uh, we've got a lot of workload but not doing too much. And so we could s see with this value, the 38 millicores, actually even our default, which seemed not so high, was actually oversized uh, compared to, uh, to what we had. Uh, with VPA, and on top of that, the development teams with limited understanding on how things were working, actually were increasing the request, hoping actually to get better results. So, so we, it's kind of deployed progressively on each workload in a different cluster. We start, we, we're starting actually to see the, the savings in, in terms of vCPUs. It doesn't change the usage. It's, it changes the perspective of the uh, allocation or the, 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 the usage that you have on your cluster and what you reserve. Uh, for memory, it's very new. I mean, it's, uh, we, we started doing that a few weeks ago. So it's deployed on the cluster, uh, on the dev cluster only. And what happens is that we, uh, uh, the, de the development team are going to set a value which is going to be used by default for the request and the limit. So basically we're working in guaranteed mode by default initially. And what's going to happen is that VPA is going to watch your activity and basically downscale uh, the request on the memory. So, so far we were able to save uh, 18 gigs of, of RAM of request. All right, so lesson learned. Um, you have to be careful about namespace or object deletion and recreation. Um, in our situation, we're, using, uh, we're not getting the, met the metrics out of Prometheus, which means they're being stored in a compacted format in a specific CR. If you remove this uh, checkpoint CR, then you lose your metrics, right? And uh, you have to start over with your recommendation. The other thing is that the recommendation is stored as a status in the VPA object. If you remove the VPA object or you replace it the next time you deploy, then for 30 seconds, you're gonna lose the recommendation. Your pod is going to start with whatever is configured on the deployment, right? So if you want to make modification on this VPA object, you've got to update it and not replace it. Um, one big learning experience, the uh, low CPU recommendation, right? And, and really, even if you don't use VPA to apply this recommendation automatically, it's a learning experience just as much as, um, I mean, doing observability and doing Grafana dashboards to watch the behavior of your, uh, of your uh, workload. Uh, one thing to, uh, to um, kind of not forget is that res uh, reserving resources based on um, uh, the P90, for instance, in the context of VPA, is basically doing overcommit at the pod level. And if you're using uh, overcommit at the virtualization layer, they could conflict with, ways with one another. So you have to be very conservative with the overcommit you, you're doing at the virtualization layer. And one very interesting thing that we got out of using VPA was that not only we were able to do fine tuning uh, from one application to another, but we were able to get uh, different recommendation and tuning for the same application in the different environment. And it's, it, it's not unusual when you start using VPA to not have the same value in production, test, and integration. You've, you've got kind of the best value. A uh, few things to, uh, uh, to be careful about in the context of JVM workload. Uh, one mistake we did at the beginning is that we wanted to protect the startup of critical application. Uh, the issue with applicat Java applicative framework is that they, they tend nowadays uh, to consume a lot of CPU at startup. So you've got a peak, an initial peak. If you size uh, uh, your request based on that, you're going to over-reserve uh, and over-consume request. So do not oversize to cope with startup. Uh, 
you would have a better efficiency. Uh, the issue, however, is then the soldering hub, what we call the soldering hub problem, which is uh, when you've got a massive amount of pods that are starting and are going to do a, a, a big, a huge peak of, uh, of, of uh, consumption. VPA is not helping you with that. So that, that's an issue. Okay, so le next, um, we want to, like I said, I mean, the next challenge for us is keeping, keep, keeping memory uh, at a sustainable level. Uh, so we, will, we want to continue working on that. Uh, and um, so get some feedback on the development cluster and start actually going up in the other cluster. We want to continue adding some density on our worker node. I mean, the ultimate goal would be at some point that we don't need the virtualization of a commit at, uh, I mean, at, at the virtualization level, and we can go to bare metal, right? You don't want to go to bare metal if you've got a low density on, uh, on, on your worker nodes. Um, we want to start working with uh, VP on one side and horizontal scaling on the other side. Uh, and specifically, we, there will be a lot of benefit if we're able to scale down, scale down to zero and back to one for, for this particular use case. So we'll be looking at HPA, but we'll invest some time on serverless as well, or uh, KEDA, for instance. And the last thing is that uh, we want to expand VP, VPA to workloads that we're not writing ourselves so that the best practices are applied to everybody. And typically what we're seeing is that vendors come with their product and uh, they ask you to configure uh, excessive uh, resource allocation to protect the product even if that's not appropriate. So we want to work on that. A few issues uh, to consider. So the first one is being pushed by uh, a colleague of mine, Matthias Berchi. Uh, which aims at uh, providing the ability to configure a target uh, percentile value different from the default 90, which is hard-coded uh, today. So we could choose with a more cost-optimized approach or a more performance-optimized approach depending on the, on the workload. It would give us more flexibility. Uh, just, uh, if you go back in the, the, the small example I was showing earlier, the perfect value was P78, right? So P78 was uh, already very conservative, and we could be saving some value by actually uh, a little bit uh, with more gambling toward a more cost-optimized cost approach. Uh, the second issue is very important. That's the, uh, that's, uh, the idea is to provide uh, Kubernetes with the ability to replace uh, requests and limits without restarting uh, the pod. This would open up uh, use cases like, like the auto, which requires that and might help also uh, as the basis for implementing something smarter for the soldering health problem. About that particular issue, uh, you may be interested in the discussion of the third point, and that's why I, I listed it there. And the last one is the, is the bug that we found. Uh, a few tools and resources to, to, to wrap up this talk. So there is a recommendation plugin that you can install on kubectl with, uh, with crew. Uh, Goldilocks a dashboard which relies on uh, the VPA recommendation engine uh, to show you on your different workloads uh, basically the, the, the values uh, that were recommended by VPA without having to scan all the, the CRs. Uh, Harness is an interesting and, and complete solution which has its own recommendation engine. And what I like about it is that they recognize that there are different types of profiles and uh, they let you choose between cost or performance or even a custom profile that you would define yourself. So you could say, I want to, the target to be calculated on the PAT, for instance. Right, and if you're interested in uh, the subject, uh, I really suggest, recommend reading the last link, which has a lot of interesting information. And with that, I think we've got time for a few questions. If anyone got a question in the room? There's one over there. Okay. I have one from online as well. Thank you. Uh, hi. Thank you for a great talk. Um, I was wondering if you had any chance to look at the Prometheus integration of the vertical pod auto scale, and if you did, if you noticed any reasons why you would choose one or the other, so the custom resource or the 
private yeah, key separation? That, that's a good question. No, we didn't look at this integration. Uh, um, there would be one, one good thing about it is that you wouldn't rely on internal storing with the CR, so you wouldn't have the, you wouldn't have the, the limitation I was talking about where if you remove this object, you lose your metrics. Uh, but uh, the good thing about not depending on it is that you don't have a dependence on, on Prometheus. So if it's not available, uh, basically VPI is, is standalone and, and it can continue. So we make the choice actually to separate both uh, at, at this point. Okay, I'm gonna read out a question from Slack from uh, Federico Her Hernandez, uh, which was, how are they practically tackling the HPA versus VPA dilemma? By which he meant uh, you could have HPA scaling out workloads which would make more pods, which would make less room for the VPA to scale. Okay, so yeah, my understanding is that, so, so we haven't studied that work, but my understanding is that uh, you can use uh, HPA with VPA, but you, can you, you, you need to use it on a metric which is not controlled by VPA. So for instance, uh, you could take request per second if you, uh, which is, I mean, the, the basic notion into, uh, in serverless. Uh, you could even use uh, uh, the CPU control resource uh, on VPA and use memory for scaling, but you don't want to actually have both metrics used in, uh, in, the two, uh, in these two uh, features. Okay, thank you. Who next? At the back, can you keep your hand up? I'll come to you next. Uh, thanks for your talk. I was just curious, as you're starting to do the uh, memory investigation, um, how are you handling the issue with the JVM? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. Uh, so I, I reached out to, uh, to different people. My understanding is that if we're doing, as long as we're doing request only, then we're probably fine. And that's what we are working on today in the development cluster. So we need to confirm this. Uh, the issue seems to be related to trying to change the limit, which we're not interested in uh, at this point. Um, specifically around um, uh, there is a way to size uh, the heap um, in relation to a ratio on the, the container memory. So if you start actually having VPA just scaling up, I mean, the, the problem is with uh, heap committed versus heap usage uh, in, in the JVM. Uh, so we're not getting, getting into the limits today. So, uh, I mean, my understanding is that we're fine with request on demand. Hi. So my question was that uh, I realized you had an open issue, but it was closed with no solution for how to uh, like uh, throttling containers starting up. Do you have any workaround in place right now that you are using? Well, my, yeah, very good point. Um, a lot of people have been complaining about uh, the, 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 I mean, throttling the startup because of JVM workloads. Uh, so, so it's a common issue. Uh, the solution could come with uh, the, uh, the other, the cap I was showing uh, earlier with the in-place uh, update of resources. So the idea was that if we had that, maybe we could um, uh, add startup over provision request to cover the startup, and once the pod is ready, downgrade the, the request. So in that case, you would have natural uh, throttling because you would have uh, you work on order, piling up big request, and suddenly free up resources as the pod gets ready. But it's, I mean, we'll see you know, <laughs> in a few years. Okay, I, th I think we're at time, so I'm not going to take any more questions. Okay, so thank you. A big, a big thank you to uh, yourself and Lombardier was able to be um, uh, able to get me on stage actually to present uh, all of this work that we've done and which is very important for us. Thank you very much and have a good conference.